And what sort of camps are you talking about? What sort of uh, prison camps were, were there in the First World War? Well, the First World War is very interesting because many people have an image of a kind of home front camp that's very well run. This comes to us largely because of officers' memoirs after the war. Officers were held in separate camps to ordinary soldiers who were captured, and officers were privileged. Their treatment was better, their camps were better, and they were able to order things like gramophones in many cases. Uh, they were able to listen to music, they were able to get quite luxurious parcels from home, etc. Other rank soldiers who were held in camps on the home front, uh, it depended which country they were in as to how well treated they were. And in some countries, they actually have quite high death rates and some national groups have quite high death rates. So Romanians in German prisoner war camps have a death rate of 29%. That's horrific for the First World War, but that's just that one nationality. And then beyond that, there are, are hundreds of thousands of prisoners, as I discovered, who never get to a home front camp at all who are captured behind the lines on the Western Front, but also on the Eastern Front, and also on the Austro-Hungarian-Italian Front as well. This is also going on there. They're held behind the lines as labour by armies that are desperate for manpower to fight trench warfare because it's so labour-intensive, or to provide fortifications in the East. So these men never see a home front camp. They're effectively working units. They have practically no rights. International law is often not applied to them, and they're they left without protection, and many of them die. And that whole idea of using them for as a labour force, I mean, that would, have been, would, would that have been against the G Geneva Convention? It was against the Hague Convention of 1907. Prisoners of war were not meant to be put to work on war tasks directly related to their captors' war effort. So it was a breach of international law. And what's interesting is almost all European belligerents adopt this as the war goes on. The first group on the Western Front to do it are the German army, who initially use Russian prisoners, who they bring from the east. They bring all across, across Germany to the Western Front to work in Belgium and northern France uh, on fortifications, often under shell fire. Often they're badly treated and these Russians are beaten. Um, but the British and French armies follow very quickly and they too adopt this use of prisoner labour on the Western Front uh, and keep this going until the end of the war. Now, you mentioned the, uh, the treatment of Romanian prisoners, so obviously different nationalities are treated differently, and as, as you also mentioned, there's a, a social class difference in, in treatment as well. Absolutely. I think the class element is very important. No officer is ever used in these working units behind the lines. They, they simply are, are they're, they're viewed differently. This is a class-based society. And actually, if one, if, one, if one looks at the Hague Convention, officers cannot be put to work as prisoners of war. They, they are paid a salary, but they are not to be put to forced uh, labour. Other rank prisoners can be made work on tasks not connected with the captor's war effort. Um, so class is really, is, is really important there. Different nationalities are also treated very differently. Uh, that's part of the, the way that camp structures and systems are set up. Certain nationalities are actually favoured because they're seen as, as potentially going to change sides, going to help their captor. So if we think about uh, Czechs and Russian captivity, the Russians form the Czech Legion out of them. They see them as dissidents within the Austro-Hungarian Empire who will come and fight for the Entente, who will change sides. The Irish in Germany are brought to Limburg camp uh, at the start of the war. They're collected there and there's a massive effort made with the help of Roger Casement to try and get them to change sides and fight for Germany. In the end, only 52, approximately 52 men change sides out of uh, over 2,000 Irishmen at that camp. Um, and what about the use of violence, because that's a particular focus of, of your study uh, in the camps to, as a method, method of control? Absolutely. There's, there's many different ways in which violence is used in these camps. Obviously, Prisoners of war are under the military law of the captor state. So if that captor state's military law allows for violent punishment as a discipline for, inf for infractions, so for example for theft or for not, 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 not obeying orders or for trying to be in the wrong part of the camp at the wrong time, etc., violence can be used as corporal punishment. For those, for those kinds of infractions and is used as corporal punishment. And in the German case, prisoners are tied to poles. This was part of the punishment in the German army at the time. It was used against German soldiers, so it's also used against prisoners of war. And the Allies protest massively at this because they don't use that same kind of military punishment. They don't have the same military law on that. And beyond that type of disciplinary violence, there's also random beatings. So if one thinks at the start of the war, by by, by 1915, Germany has, over, Germany has over a million prisoners of war. It's a huge number. They weren't prepared for this. Everybody, all the belligerents, were expecting a short war. They don't have the camps. They don't have the systems in place. They have to force these men to build their own prisoner of war camps, keeping them in fields, effectively, in, in, in the autumn and winter of 1914 and making them build their own camps uh, while suffering from exposure and sleeping outside. And they're also mixed up at this point with, with civilian internees who, who, and people who've been deported from Belgium and France who were ordinary civilians. So it's chaos. How do you control men in a situation of chaos? Well, you, in many cases, guards resort to random acts of violence, to beatings, as a way of controlling them. We also have different military cultures. So in the Russian army, for example, 
officers regularly beat the ordinary soldiers, therefore prisoners of war also often get regularly beaten. It's, it's, it, the transfer between the cultures is quite fluid because guards obviously have been part of the normal army before they become uh, prisoner of war guards. British and French case is a bit different. They're more limited in the kinds of violence they use against prisoners of war. Um, they, there's more stringent controls in the kinds of violence that, that is used. So it's actually quite rare in a British home front camp for a prisoner of war to be, to be randomly beaten. It, it doesn't happen very often. And in fact, the main type of violence that we see in the British case is when uh, a group of civilian internees riot uh, in one of the Isle of Man camps and, 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 and are shot, uh, a number are shot dead at that point. The other kinds of violence we see are at the end of the war when the camps are being liberated. Again, there's chaos, it's the German Revolution, and some German guards in panic resort to shooting into the crowd when prisoners start protesting about not being let out of the camps, about wanting to go to the local town, wanting to be free uh, because they feel the war is at an end. And their guards resort to violence to try and keep control. And the other main kind of violence is in the German army on the Western Front in 1918 when it's losing control of, of, of its prisoner workers, uh, again in the chaos of, 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 of a massive advance following the Ludendorff offensive, and they use beatings against the prisoner workers to try and make them work harder. These men are being made work 14 hour days, they're exhausted. These prisoners working for the German army on the Western Front are not getting food parcels, so they're very hungry, they're suffering from malnutrition. Again, you're, you're a guard, you need to complete a military task, you need to, to, to unload those, those, that cargo of shells or you need to, to get that communication trench uh, ready for, for people to pass through it. How do you make these men work in such heavy tasks? Well, you beat them. And that's what's happening in 1918 in the German army. And that's a development on from a certain type of violent reprisal that the German army has started in 1916 and 1917, where they start to get much more ruthless in how they treat their prisoners. And you then see that coming out really to the fore in 1918. And what about the impact on people that, uh, I mean, first of all, they've been captured, so presumably there's a certain shame involved in that. And secondly, they're being mistreated like this. I mean, it must have been a terrible impact on them. Yes, I think the psychological impact is very strong. And we do find accounts in the 1920s of men who've been very very severely traumatised. Uh, I, I again would flag that treatment in, in, the, in the German case is, is the worst on the Western Front. Uh, the French treat their prisoner labourers quite bad, but uh, after 1916 actually improved their policy. So they use their prisoner labourers, their German prisoner labourers, under shell fire on the Verdun battlefield. So you can imagine these Germans working for the French are having a horrendous time as well. They're actually located in Fort Douaumont uh, for, 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 se for several months at the heart of the Verdun uh, battle. And so in, in these cases, we, we do find psychological trauma. And those British prisoners who've been working for the Germans, particularly in 1918, do go home in some cases quite, quite, quite shell-shocked, quite traumatised. They've been in a very difficult situation. They've effectively been working against their own side. So we, we do see a legacy. It's very hard to trace, however, because the sources aren't really there. It was quite difficult for these men to get that kind of psychological trauma recognised, to get a pension for it, and to get it recognised as a real war injury. There's a stigma around psychological trauma as well. So what we find is some of them turning to alcoholism in the 1920s. What we find is those who are asked to go to Germany to give evidence in war crimes trials in 1921, not wanting to go or getting drunk before they get on the train. That kind of response. Um, men who are, who are fearful to leave Britain again, for example, um, or who simply, who simply suffer physically, who are never able to work at manual labour again after their war experiences on the Western Front. One of the aspects you've written about is, is race, and I found that very interesting because obviously for some European soldiers, guards at prison camps, perhaps it was the first time they, they would have met somebody of a different race. Yes, indeed. I mean, one has to remember that in, in, in 1914, for example, a large proportion of the British Army on the Western Front is actually Indian troops who've been brought over to fill the gap because Britain has a very small army in 1914. It's not prepared for a European war and it's facing a mass conscript army of over a million uh, Germans. So. There is, there is a very diverse uh, a group of people on the Western Front. And if we think of the Battle of the Somme, which often is stereotyped in, public, in the public mindset as a, a, a very European battle, actually there's many, many different ethnicities and nationalities present. Uh, again, if we think of Gallipoli, there are Senegalese troops at Gallipoli. So the, these are imperial powers that are fighting the First World War and they mobilize their imperial subjects to come to Europe and, and to fight. And also they mobilise them in other theatres, so in Mesopotamia, in East Africa, etc. And when these men are captured in, 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 on the European battlefield, it does cause something of a sensation. Uh, in the case of Germany, uh, 
Germany doesn't quite know how to treat uh, it, colonial troops that it captures. Um, it, does, it, it, it gathers its, uh, it tries to gather its, its Muslim North African prisoners of war and, uh, and, and, and British Indian Muslim prisoners of war in the one camp to try and convert them to fight for the Ottoman Empire, which is declared jihad at the start of the war. This policy doesn't really work, uh, but it's an illustration of how the, the German authorities feel it's better to put all these prisoners in the one place because they have specific dietary needs, they have specific cultural needs, and Germany's really not sure how to, how to go about dealing with these. It doesn't have that much experience of being an imperial power in Islamic areas. And there, I found, I found uh, documents where they, they, they are unsure as to why the Indian prisoners they've caught uh, in, in one camp before they're brought to Zossen, which is the main camp specifically for uh, colonial, colonial prisoners, where, uh, where, where the authorities in a local camp simply don't know what to feed them and they can't understand why uh, Muslim prisoners aren't eating pork, Hindu prisoners aren't eating uh, beef. And this has to be explained to them by the Centre for Oriental Studies in Berlin that actually you cannot feed these men uh, these foods. Uh, so there's this, there is this sense of, of, of this being a, f a being, being a really new encounter for Europeans. Now actually colonial troops have been used in Europe in the Franco-Prussian War before. It isn't entirely new. But what's new is the scale in the First World War and what's new is the length of time these men are in these camps which allows for different kinds of interactions and allows for uh, different, different, different kinds of experiences. And, and race is ultimately fundamental to the First World War and to how the war is seen at the time. Europeans themselves start categorizing themselves in terms of different races during the war. So the French start to see the Germans very much as, a, as actually a different species. Um, you have medical journal articles that refer to Germans smelling differently. They're, being, they're, they're different heights to, to, to the French. They, they, they're, they're, their bodies decompose differently. I mean, this is actually published in reputable journals. So there's a sense of race as something that's, that's really, when we look at the war, that's really being redefined by the war and reanalyzed. And actually some of the British and French propaganda tries to show uh, basically black or, or African prisoners in German camps as, as more dignified and more cultured and civilised than the German guards they're encountering. So you get caricatures of, 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 of uh, uh, and underneath it's written, who is the barbarian? And obviously the German is depicted as the barbarian. So this is a really key part of the First World War and it's only something we're really researching now. Um, you mentioned the uh, Ottoman Jihad and uh, did, when the Turks actually caught, uh, captured soldiers serving in the British army, um, Muslim prisoners were treated better than, than some others? This is a reference to the, to the siege of Qut al Amara and to the Mesopotamian front. And there was an Ottoman policy to try and, 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 and to try and treat uh, fellow Muslims uh, uh, differently. This is part of the flux that's happening in the Ottoman Empire war, which is becoming, as the war goes on, very much a Turkish nationalist project and using Islam in a different way to the way that the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century ha had been constructed and had existed, which was actually quite a toler tolerant place until the late 19th century when it starts to uh, unleash pogroms against its, its, its Christian minorities. What we see in, in the siege of Qut al Amara is that uh, the Ottoman Empire takes a large number of Indian uh, troops serving with the British. Some of them are Hindu, some of them are Muslim, some of them are Sikh, some of them are Christian. And it's quite difficult actually for the Ottomans to distinguish amongst those groups when they initially capture them. So in fact, all of those prisoners and the white British prisoners, which again includes uh, all the different groups in the United Kingdom, um, some of those, pr all those prisoners have to be marched up to the north of what is now modern day Iraq, to where the first train line uh, links back to Anatolia, back to the heartland of, of, the, of the Ottoman Empire. And during the march, all of them are mistreated, Muslim troops included. But when they get uh, to the north, there's a process of segregation and then the Muslim prisoners are treated a bit better and get better food rations. Um, there were, of course, German prisoners held in Ireland uh, during the course of the war. I mean, what was their experience? They're held in, in Ireland very briefly at the start of the war and, and they're mainly held at Temple Moor. Uh, there's civilian internees who are also held at Old Castle. Temple Moor is today the Garda Barracks and it's over 2,000 German prisoners of war and also civilian internees are, are held there uh, between 1914 and 1915. They're then moved to camps in Britain uh, precisely because it's, it's, they're seen as a security threat because the local population are that bit too friendly to them. And I've read accounts uh, by German prisoners of war who were later either exchanged or repatriated. There was a system for people who were very badly wounded uh, to be exchanged back. And they describe how the locals, when they were being marched up to the barracks, offered them chocolate and how they had a great time in Ireland. They actually find the Irish population very friendly and they're allowed to celebrate the Kaiser's birthday in the prisoner of war camp. So the official line at the time was that they were being moved because the barracks was needed for Irish recruits to the British Army as part of the mobile for the war effort but the reality is they're being moved because there's a sense that they might get in contact with dissidents and this could be a risk there's already quite a strong radical nationalism in the area